Every team member we have actively develops their technical skills, often through blogs or attending events, and of course, in their day-to-day -day work. But what if you've got a natural leader on your team? How do you foster them? To explore this for us, we have Azechi Britton, Principal and CTO in Residence at ImpactX, talking to Gergé Oros, an author and mentor and former engineering manager at Uber on developing engineers into leaders. Hi, everyone. Gergé, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, and I'm assuming everyone else can hear us. Great to be here. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, welcome, everyone, to this Fireside Chat with Gergé Oros, where we're going to discuss how to give engineers a path to leadership. So as I'm sure you're all aware of by now, this session will be recorded, and please feel free to add any questions at any time in the chat section on your right. There will be a Q&A section at the end. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to Gergé to give a quick introduction to himself. Gergé. Yep. So, so I'm, I'm Gergé. As you can tell from my name, I'm, I'm not from the UK, although I lived there for quite a while. I'm originally from Hungary and my career spanned from starting to work at small local companies after graduating university. I, I lived quite a bit in the UK, uh, two years in Edinburgh, five years in London where I, I worked at an Edinburgh financial consultancies in London. I worked at JP Morgan, then, then at Skype, Skyscanner at, at Uber, high growth companies the past couple of years, where I, I went from um, engineer all, all the way to, to manager of managers. Fantastic. So look, Gogo, you, you've been an engineer. I've been an engineer. For those of you who don't know, I was a developer for over 10 years and a CTO for five. And now I work in the venture capital space. Um, so you and I have both come across many interesting individuals in that space. So we've got a good chunk of time now. So how about you give me some information about your route into leadership? and your journey. You've worked for some fascinating companies, all brands everyone's familiar with. So talk to us a bit about your journey, Gergé. So my journey is when you look at it and when you look at my LinkedIn, it does paint a very you know, nice picture and looking back, well, yeah, it, it looks nice, but in some ways it is a typical journey for software engineers. And I'm not talking about the companies, I'm talking about my progression of of where I went and I'll, I'll go a little bit, but but in, in just a short overview, I went from being an engineer to a bit of a tech lead, that gray area, which is between manager and 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 and, and an engineering lead. I went to become a manager and then in the end I was a manager of managers. So that's the short of it. But behind the scenes there's there's a lot more to it. So one of the things that perhaps I benefited from, I changed companies frequently, not because I wanted to, but because of opportunities. I spent a few years at a small company, um, a local company where I, I just learned the the, the basics of, of the trade, then moved to the UK where I, I, I was more of a junior engineer at this company. But my biggest leadership growth happened when I moved up, uh, moved up to London and specifically when I joined Skype. Uh, I was lucky to join Skype at the time. I like to say Skype. It was Microsoft, right? When Microsoft bought Skype, but Microsoft had this a new internal rule that they're going to leave companies that they buy alone for 18 months because they just got burned. This was the old Microsoft, Seed Balmer's Microsoft. They got burned by double click and, and that acquisition blowing up. So for 18 months, it was just Skype. And at Skype, the really interesting thing was Skype did this massive experiment to turn everyone onto Scrum. We, we got the best training from one of the founders of the Agile Manifest. So I forgot what his name was. The whole company went there. And we all became, we all went to form Scrum teams and, and we have Scrum masters. Uh, and and we, we rotated that, that role. And I was really, really keen to be a Scrum master just because I thought it's fascinating to do something like that. And that was my first taste of leadership. Now, this, this didn't can't come from me doing it. This was more like, who wants to be a Scrum master? And I said, sure, I'll be. And it turns out a lot of engineers around me didn't want to be Scrum masters. And I, I didn't understand why. And after a while, and we went around and everyone was a scrum master. And most people said, I don't want to be a scrum master again. It was too distracting. I didn't like doing it, but I I, I kept at it. Uh, and, and I also started to observe one of the things I really like being a scrum master uh, is how I, initially I thought this would be, this would just not work. Like it, it seemed a lot of, it seemed new, but it seemed there's all these rules, the rituals, the, the retrospectives. It's a lot of work. But after a few weeks, I saw the team working better. And I was like, huh, 
That's interesting. All I do is just follow, honestly, some silly rules. If if you know classics from, I, it's it's silly in 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 the things we we followed it to the T. We had the rituals. We had coaches there telling us to do this or that, and and we had to use cars to do estimations. But it was really interesting how team got better just by following some arbitrary rules that someone came up with. And that was a point where I started to think, you know what? I kind of enjoy helping teams get better. Now, I was really, I was really, I felt very junior. I was in a team of about 20 engineers. 10 of them were more senior than me in terms of years of experience. I was a mid-level engineer, not even a senior at Microsoft. So I kind of you know, knew my place. But one thing I started to do was I started to observe my managers. I started to see, hmm, what are they doing? On our one-on-ones, I paid a bit more attention. Uh, I, I started to just take a list of the things I didn't like that my managers were doing. And we'll, we'll probably get back to that later. And then uh, after a few years at Microsoft, I, I wasn't seeing career progression, mostly because I, I blamed it at the time of my manager. But I had, I had a manager who didn't promote me, despite me never asking. But I, I, uh. I really, and I changed teams to another team, which, which had a good reputation for being a great team, which the manager there was a micromanager, which, again, it was good, but I also didn't get promoted there. Uh, so in the end, uh, when Performance Review came after two years at Microsoft, no promotions, and I was kind of huffing and puffing. Uh, promotions always come in and annual raises at Microsoft in, in August. Uh, by September, I was I decided I'm going to go somewhere else, and I joined uh, a startup, uh, more of a startup that's back in the day, Skyscanner. A lot of you, of course, uh, would, would, would know this. And I was really lucky never to join. Never heard of it, go, go. Never heard of it. <laughs> never heard of it. I was, one of the, I was one of the first people in London, actually. But I, I joined a, one of their acquisitions. Uh, they acquired a tiny startup, and I was a, with two founders, and I was a th- first engineer there. And completely accidentally, I was put in a position where I was asked to hire my team to build a mobile team. I was building the mobile app, and they told me hire people. And I said, how? They said, Here's your opportunity, Gergay. Figure it out. So I became a manager with without knowing what I'm doing. You know, there's just this, this T-shirt of I'm an engineering manager riding a bike. The bike is on fire. I have no idea what I'm doing. That, that was me. So I just I, I looked up uh, blogs, etc., uh, on on what to do things. I, I hired people, had one-on-ones with them. Um, it, it, I think I did okay, but I, I, I in hindsight I did the the usual rookie mistakes. And then the interesting. Uh, Next step in my career was I decided to to leave London uh, for for different reasons, and I got this really good opportunity for from Uber, uh, and I was already pretty much a manager, a tech lead, whatever you want to call it. My title was principal engineering lead, and they offered me a se- senior engineering role. And this Uber was really hyped back then. It, it was probably the best place you could go. It was like like Slack today when we know it was getting acquired, and and so, 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 so some of these things. Um, I asked if I could join as a as a tech lead, but they said no. You can only join as a senior engineer. So I went in as a senior engineer. I was like, it's, it's Uber, and my previous skills <laughs> were pretty valuable. There weren't there weren't too many experienced people around. No one has really been a tech lead before. So I, be- I found myself becoming manager very quickly. Uh, I saw a gap there. Uh, my manager had too many reports, and I told him, look. Uh, I actually want to be a manager. If there's an opportunity, can we make it happen? And and we did. And at Uber, there was the strict rule of having an apprentice management program. Uh, so you had to go through training because Uber realized, of course, uh, this was around 2017. A lot of you have heard the bad press, but Uber realized that a lot of their managers were brand new. They wanted to get training. So I kind of get, get, got a double training. That apprentice program was really good. I got some really good training. Uh, I had the opportunity to ask questions. People knew I was junior. And I also got very strong mentors at Uber. One of my mentors is a reporter CTO. She's now COO at DoorDash. So I had some fantastic mentors right. to learn from. And that, that is my leadership story in a nutshell. It's both typical, but not typical. I was lucky that I got opportunities to move into management. But I also realized early on that it's something at some point I might want to do, not really management, but more helping people get better. So. That's a fascinating story, Gogo, and I love the the progression that you experience and the, the level of serendipity there as well. So how do you remove some of that luck from that journey? How do you go about creating the pathway to leadership in engineering when you're building out your teams going forwards? So are, are we talking about uh, you as a leader uh, helping others become a leader or you saying, I'm an engineer and I want to become a leader? I'd say you individually, what, what approach do you take to creating the pathway for others to leadership within your organizations? So the, the, my approach has been, 
I think I kind of, I became a leader, I'm going to say by luck. I was at the right time, at the right place where this was Skyscanner, where a team was expanding. Because at Skype, I, I Skype, honestly, I wasn't given this, well, I was given some leadership opportunity with, uh, with the Scrum Master, but I would have never become a, an official manager at, at some point. And there was no real concept that Skype, it, the teams had a manager and there was a senior engineer and it was kind of democracy, but it was the senior engineers, the title inflation was, was sorry, not inflation, but senior engineers had a bigger say. It, it felt a bit hierarchical. What I started to do at Uber uh, when I joined is looking back at myself, I, I was a pretty capable leader and I saw some other people around me who were also just good at natural leading, but they never got that opportunity. And I, my manager took a big risk on me. Well, not a big risk, but a medium risk on me at Uber uh, because he had 30 reports. Uh, he was actually about to quit. Uh, he asked to hire more managers, but we couldn't hire fast enough or he kept saying no to people. I'm not sure which one. And he advocated for me to become a manager. My management chain did not want me to become a manager at Uber because uh, Amsterdam back then had this impression that we had too many junior managers, including my manager. And my manager stood to the ground. He said, I think Gerge is good. Uh, if and I think he in the end he said if 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 we don't get me into apprentice management or if we don't he doesn't get support he's going to leave and that's how I got into apprentice management so he put he he put a lot of faith into me and and in the end he told me that he was happy that he did that and I wanted to repay this and I and I I just also one of the things when you're a leader you do have the opportunity to take a chance on people and what I find is when you do this and. You know, is actually, I know we talked about this, but you, you have a somewhat similar philosophy in, in your venture capital yeah. investments. Maybe we can touch on that. On um, when you give people who seem a little bit underdogs or, or not expecting the opportunity, they will work harder. So my yeah, observation absolutely. was, if I give, and you know, like I think that's a bit how you are investing right now. No, <laughs> I like to think so. Yeah, absolutely. But so my what I started to do at Uber is uh, I assigned uh, a lead role to each of the projects that we we're running on my team. I had initially about five to eight people, let's say eight people, and we had about two to three projects running parallel. And I I could have led all the projects myself. I could have been the, you know, I told people what to do or, or, or whatnot, or we could have had the senior engineers run it. I actually made it clear that we're going to have a lead on each team uh, who needs to follow certain expectations from me. So they will, I will be accountable and responsible. If, if, if a project goes wrong and someone needs to be fired, I should be the one or, you know, they're not going to fire me, I hope, but, and they didn't, but uh, it, that should be me, but I'm going to pass on responsibility to, to the person and I'm going to tell them what I expect from them, but I'll, I'll be careful not to micromanage. So I'll tell, tell them that I expect this and that. And I, I publicly made a statement to the team that this person is, is the, the lead for the project. Initially, I assigned the most senior people who actually had some experience leading projects to, to lead these projects. And I was there to help them and support them. And I wanted them to succeed. And, and also, whenever the project would go well, they would take the limelight. If it goes poorly, I'm going to take the blame on it. And then I start to rotate. So after we had one or two people or three people who, who led this project, I told them for the next one, I'd like this more junior person to lead the project. And they were really surprised. Both the junior person was like, what? Are you sure? I was like, yep. And some of the senior people were like, hang on, are you sure? I, I did a pretty good job. I'm like, yes, you did a good job. But now your task is to help this person succeed, to, to mentor them, to, to set them up for success. And I followed this model, which I didn't come up with this, by the way. Um, there's a book called Turn the Ship Around, where a Navy officer in the US Navy and, and submarines, he, he apparently rolled out something similar where he turned from the worst performing submarines that he had no clue how to operate into the best performing one by delegating responsibility. And the response has been very, very good. Uh, retention on my team was non-existent. Uh, people did not leave the team or the company throughout my tenure uh, for about four years. Uh, promotions were just very fast for people because they took on more responsibility. And I wasn't optimizing for that, but this happened. And people just became I'm going to say they grew faster than on other teams, not on every team, but in general, and you know, this is a bit, I don't want to overgeneralize, right? Everyone has their own path. Uh, but it seemed it just worked. People were more confident. Uh, the team started, and people started to have this leader identity outside of when they were leaders. They took more initiative. They started to talk with product people. They brought ideas. They, they challenged the product managers. Product managers love working with my team because they said everyone just is so independent and autonomous. So this is what worked for me. Uh, there might be other ways, but so I think I think that's fantastic. So to to kind of wrap that up, for you it was a case of give people the opportunity, 
give them a chance to show to show leadership and then support them and mentor them as they do that right and give and, them that chance one thing, one thing i learned i'm going to jump on that one thing i learned early on is it's not enough to give the opportunity i some people just don't know how to do it so uh, you have to balance, and I, I got this idea from, from someone or somewhere I read, uh, the levels of delegation. If someone doesn't know how to do something, you, you actually direct. You tell them do one, two, and three, and don't ask questions, just do it. It, it sounds harsh, but that's what you want to do. If someone is better at it, you mentor them. You say, here's how I would do it, but you know, feel free to do it differently, like without any irony. And if someone is better than you, uh, you just get out of their way. They say, and you you coach them. You ask them, have you thought of this? Uh, what about this edge case? Uh, how? What is your biggest challenge? Those kind of things. Those soft coaching questions. The mistake I made early on actually was I, I gave too much too much uh, leeway to people. Some people were freaked out on how should they lead a team. I had a document that had really vague expectations because I didn't want to, to tell them what to do exactly. So I actually did, did a revised version saying, if you're a first time project lead, do daily standups, send an email to me every week. Here's a template you should use. Um, do all of these things. I had a long list. And I said, and after you've done this, talk to me about it and reflect on it. And for your right. next project, you can decide what you want to change. And that actually helped a lot of people. Some people wanted to be micromanaged in the sense of they, they were just really afraid of, of how to do this. It was a big surprise right. for me because I, already, I think I already forgot what it was like for me when I just had no clue. But what, what I like there is you really distinguish between how do you coach juniors and those who want to become leaders, but there's also that distinction between people who are becoming leader versus those who are leaders or are senior and how do you coach them as well because you have leaders in your team. But leading on to our next question, and this is a really big one, a lot of people ask this, do you believe you need to be a great engineer to be a great engineering leader? So my short answer is yes, but it's not just because of what my experience is. And I'm not going to say great engineer by it. I'm going to say a competent engineer. Uh, I talked with a leader, uh, an engineering manager, who told me that uh, that they they felt they made a big mistake early in their career. After two years of being an engineer, they really wanted to become a manager. They knew they wanted to become a manager. They had the opportunity, they became a manager. And a few years in, they felt out of their depth when they had to mentor these people with 10 or 20 years of experience as engineers. And they, they were never at the senior role. So what they did actually at Uber, they came to Uber to become a senior engineer, worked in that role for two years, and they went to being back an engineering manager. And they said they needed that two right. years to prove and to learn. And now they can actually mentor and help coach. So what I advise to people, and I, I, I advise to, to everyone is uh, on one end, don't, if you have an opportunity to move into management or to try it out, you know, take it because there, there aren't too many opportunities and you want to see if, if you're any good at it and if you like it, but be patient enough to wait until you're at, let's say a senior level. So like maybe when you have five years in the industry and, and you moved around a little bit, you're, you're confident that you're a good engineer because one of the first things you need to do as a manager is you need to you are expected to mentor and coach people to at least to that whatever that senior level is, not necessarily beyond, but just when people are can write good. You should you just pop when people don't write good enough code, when they have collaboration issues, when they have obvious bugs in their architecture. You should be able to point resources, etc. If you don't have that, you can still be a good manager, but you're it'll be hard for you to win the trust of the engineers. It'll hard for, be hard for you to to grow with them. You're going to be a hands off manager and every leader I've ever I've ever worked with personally who I look up to has always been they had that technical sense because they were at some point a senior engineer or, or at that level it's you know it, it's not about the title it's about that expertise so I I think you you need to do that and this is my opinion I'm happy to like you, you might see that you can be proven wrong but I, I feel this is a safe way I think it's very risky you can be a good manager without doing that, but you need to have some very good senior engineers on your team who can help you and who you can rely on fully. If you don't have that, you'll be in trouble. Fantastic. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so we've got some great questions from the audience I'm going to start bringing in. Um, and this is one that I find really interesting as well. To, from your perspective, what's the different? what's different about leadership in engineering versus other roles within an organization? I feel 
I feel you need to, maybe this is not too different. Uh, I, I do wonder sometimes if us, if us engineers are over mystifying how engineering is different than other things. And sometimes I think we, we tend to overthink this. Uh, one thing I'll say is an engineering, for, for a typical software engineer, their work, you can look at the code and you can look at the artifacts and you can totally understand that. If, if I compare it to something like, let's say, accounting or, or, or law, you might actually not pay that much attention. I think as a leader, you have the ability to dive into individuals' work, uh, which is both a good thing, but a bad thing. I've had some VPs so at Uber, uh, someone who, who who supervises 600 people or like is, you know, like has under them, who pinged one of my engineers directly saying, this feature, you know, I looked at the code, uh, it doesn't seem like a big deal. When will it be done? <laughs> like, excuse me. <laughs> like, first of all, you shouldn't do that, but you have the opportunity to do so. Uh, so, I th I think that's a huge difference. That when you get to leadership, you actually can look through the whole stack in our organization's code repositories and documentation. Everything is there. Uh, I do see at, at Uber. I saw uh, directors and others comment on to design documents, and sometimes not really the code. They didn't touch that, but but they were there. I think that's a big difference. It's, it's, it's a bit like if you're right. in a construction site, you, you don't have this access. So that's the biggest one I see. OK, there, there's a really interesting question here. and I'm going to paraphrase it. And forgive me if uh, the, the emphasis is incorrect, but it's what would you recommend us to develop from managers to manager of managers? And do you miss coding? And I believe what's being asked here is how do you make that change from being a manager to that pedagogy of managing managers? And what was the biggest learning for you in that? So I, I, I made this change about a year and a half ago, and it is a very big change. Uh, for me, going to, to going from developer to manager felt smaller of a change because I prepared for it. And there's a lot of materials and you can talk to a, a lot of people. With manager of the managers, you, have a, you, you lose control even a lot more. And you have to fully rely on on that person, and and it turned into a lot of coaching. Uh, the results will be slower as well. It's very interesting because if things go well with the new manager, so or with the manager that you're managing, it's okay. But it's the question, the the challenge is really when something doesn't go wrong, and how do you debug that manager and their team? One like thing that how do that you debug I, a manager? I like that phrase. And and one thing I think you should remember is is you you you. When you become a manager, manager, you kind of you you have a, a t your team is now those managers, but there's one layer underneath them which is their directs, and you do want to keep an eye, an ear on the ground. You do want to have one on ones with your skip levels, especially with a few key skip levels, and you want to listen to the signals. You also need to become a lot more patient. This is something I found hard. When you become a manager, you learn to be a bit more patient because you can't have it immediately. But as a manager of manager, you need to be even more patient. You almost have to stop yourself from caring too much on the short term. So you you and you need to, just like when you're a manager and, and you're coaching a junior engineer, you you know they're gonna fail, but you don't tell them they're gonna fail, you let them fail. You sometimes need to do that with managers. Um, the the best advice I have though is is get a mentor. Like like what I mean by that, either pay for a service like Plato or even better if you can have it within the organization or someone that, that you know who, who has made that transition to manager of managers because it is different. You'll be out of your depth and it is, it's even harder to get feedback. Mm, I like that. I, lo I love that debugging managers piece and I do really believe in that giving people the freedom to fail. Uh, a manager of mine, a good friend and advisor once said to me, give people enough rope to hang themselves with, but be there to catch them when they fall. And I think that's really important. And that comes down to that, that support that the managers need as well. And there was one last bit there was, do you miss the coding? Do you still code? I know you're right. Yeah, so I, it's very interesting. I I had a long and I think successful career in, in, in software engineering. I, I went from, I, I worked from, full, from thick client back when they were thick client, WPF and, and so on, web development. I did distributed systems. I did mobile and iOS, Android and Windows phone. I was at the point I was talking with my manager before at Uber when I was a senior engineer. I told him, look, I could either be a manager or I could be an engineer. And But I told him I'm not as excited about being an engineer because I because I, I didn't feel there's as much for me to grow. My biggest growth would be how do I uh, influence these bigger groups at Uber? And now that I've, I've now left Uber and I, I did code a little bit on the side, I realized I, I don't miss coding. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's, it's a tool. I can get things done. My wife actually, since the day I stopped coding when I became manager, she started to, she became a developer with a bootcamp. And so she started it. Um, I, I, I feel there's so little that I can improve. So I, I felt I got to a really good place where I was very happy with. Uh, it, it's a it's a bit and I don't think I can improve as much. I find people a lot more interesting, and you know what? The more the longer I'm a manager or or I'm not in the coding role, I'm now finding business fascinating. Understanding how our company is successful, what makes the money, uh, what drives mm -hmm. customers, uh, and I'm learning so much about that psychology. So, but I think everyone will be different, right? This is just my experience. Absolutely, but I think I think that's a really important step step change, and it's a different experience. I now work as a VC, even though I was a developer way, for 10 years. Oh, sorry, so go sorry. Go I didn't really cut you off. Just no, one no, last no, thing no. on if you miss it or not. I, I found that I didn't miss it because I went back to doing it. And what, by the way, if you were at a level where you could cope comfortably, it doesn't go away. It's, it's like riding a bicycle is there. So that actually gave me a lot of comfort. And when I go back to coding and I sometimes coach my or help my, my wife, it, it like I, I still code like a senior engineer. Maybe I'll need to get a, a bit of being up to speed, but it it's there. And by the way, I, I had uh, directors who who still are detected in their free time. It doesn't go away, so you can always go back to it. Okay, right. We've only got just under just under two minutes left. I think this is a really important question. Um, someone's touched on it around apprenticeship programs, formal mentorship. These are great in the larger organizations, but how do you grow your skills as a leader when you're possibly the only engineer in that entire organization if you're a smaller company? So as, as a manager or as an engineer? Or both? Uh, well, as, as an engineer and a manager where you might be the CTO, the senior dev, the dev, in that organization, when you don't have that support to grow yourself, how do you grow? I, I believe that you can only grow when you learn from someone. Well, when, okay, you, you grow when you try out new things and to try out new things, you need to get inspired and you also want to get feedback. I used to not care or, or believe too much in mentorship when I was an engineer. And I think I got, got away with it because I had people around me. As a manager, get a mentor. If you are the only one, have your company invest in you. And again, there are you can get connect with people online or meet people uh, locally. So you might be able to do it for free. Just just reaching out to people saying, hey, I'm also I'm a manager. Uh, do you want to meet up and just start with having coffee or go to dedicated places where for not a huge fee for like three, four, five hundred dollars, pounds a month, you actually can get paired with experienced people. I, I do this. So there's this service called this is Plato. Um, there's some other ones as well. I don't get paid anything. I just volunteer my free time. The company charges money, so it's a great business model for them. But I do it because I love connecting to people and giving them a bit of guide. Often I, I just confirm that they're doing the right thing. Do that. It's it's affordable. It's there. Get a mentor if, if you don't have it. You need it. Uh, you need it more than Brilliant. you think you do. Fantastic. And I think with that, that's us done. Thank you, Gerge, for talking with us today. You can connect with both Gerge and myself after the session on social media. We're both available on LinkedIn. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you all for joining. It's been a pleasure. Yep, and I'll be hanging out on the chat as well, so on the Slack group.